Early this month, an orange haze descended upon the city of New York and a large portion of the rest of the American East Coast. While the Breaking Bad Mexico filter that fell across much of the US has since faded, its cause is still very much raging on. As early as March, lightning across Canada's vast forested north ignited wildfires in nine of ten provinces and two of three territories, leaving only the territory of Nunavut and the province of Prince Edward Island without recorded wildfires. Quite unfortunately, the Great North was the victim of below-average snowfall last winter, coupled with climate change-aggravated bouts of record heat, which left the nation's forests particularly vulnerable to being set aflame. Sure enough, lightning storms across the country have started more than 2,600 fires, which have burned over 13 million acres of land, roughly the same area as the country of Costa Rica. Adding to the struggle is Canada's comparatively lacking wildfire and forestry management programs, which have a history of being less than well-funded. In 1910, what was then one of the worst fires in US's history destroyed more than 3 million acres of land in just two days, only being extinguished by a rainstorm on the 22nd of August 1910. The blaze captured public sentiment, and in the same year, the US federal government rapidly expanded the US Forestry Service and moved to protect vast swathes of land from future fires, which might erupt. The next year, Canada suffered a similar disaster in the Porcupine Fire, and although only burning under half a million acres, the flames were even more intense, wiping out entire towns and any trace they were ever there. Unlike the US, however, Canada blamed the indigenous First Nations peoples for the fire, and adamantly refused to practice forestry and fire management techniques. Additionally, Canada banned many First Nations peoples from practicing their own forestry management programs, causing significant harm to forest health. Even in the face of other destructive fires, Canada steadfastly refused to create a national firefighting service, ultimately designating that responsibility to the provinces in 1930, many of which cut their respective budgets to save money. Since the most recent wave of wildfires began, Canada has been receiving aid from across the world, with firefighters arriving from Australia, New Zealand, the European Union and the United States. Prime Minister Trudeau has expressed his gratitude to the foreign nations and noted that Canada typically sends firefighters overseas during other nations' fire seasons, a service they will continue to provide. In good news, of the 2,600 fires so far this season, only 385 are still burning, of which just 130 30 are considered uncontrolled. Conspiracy theories regarding the fires were also rife across the internet, with one major theory being arson, with theorists citing several fires starting simultaneously as evidence. Others saw videos of firefighters performing controlled burns as evidence that the government secretly started the fires on purpose to force new climate change proposals into law. These were both debunked, first with experts noting that when lightning strikes damp ground, it can cause dry fuel under the surface to smolder, eventually igniting to a full fire when the sun dries it out. As a thunderstorm can strike multiple places while raining, multiple separate spots can dry out and ignite simultaneously. Additionally, controlled burns are a legitimate firefighting tactic, where firefighters burn a small area of land to deny a fire fresh fuel, halting its spread. Canada's fire season is roughly halfway over, so we should expect to hear more about the nation's fire program over the coming months. Our next story concerns a prominent political figure accused of great crimes which may tilt the balance of the upcoming 2024 election. We're of course talking about the Senegalese politician Ousmane Sonko. 
Despite its location, the West African nation of Senegal prides itself on being uncharacteristically stable for this part of the world. Which is why, when protests broke out on the 1st of June, we knew shit was getting serious. The centerpiece of this story, as mentioned, is Usman Sonko, a Senegalese politician who placed third in the 2019 presidential election, taking a respectable 15.7% of the vote. Mr. Sonko initially made his name as a high-ranking tax inspector, blowing the whistle on multiple fraudulent business practices by some of the wealthiest members in Senegalese society. This campaign against corruption earned Mr. Sonko and his party widespread support among younger generations, who have long criticized government corruption for their poor economic prospects. This is where things get a bit fucky. As in 2021, Sonko was accused of sexual assault and casting death threats at a spa worker. As the worker was below the age of 21, the politician was also hit with a charge for, quote, corrupting the youth. These types of allegations are hard to prove or disprove at the best of times, but in a country like Senegal, and to a rising opposition leader notorious for exposing corruption, this shit becomes immeasurably more complicated. Usman Sonko was already the victim of numerous bullshit hit pieces which dropped shortly before the 2019 election. So when his supporters claimed that the current government were out to get him, they actually had a leg to stand on. Fast forward to the 1st of June, and Mr. Sonko would be acquitted of both the sexual assault and death threat charges, but would be sentenced to two years for corrupting the youth. In case anyone needed to be reminded, this was the same crime that put Socrates to death over 2,400 years ago. Although not forced to drink poison, Usman Sonko would instead be sentenced to two years in prison, a decision that came with mixed reactions. On one hand, feminist activist groups in Senegal hoped that this case would be a landmark of progress for women's rights, as having a major politician sentenced for sexually assaulting someone would be a major win in a country where such sentences are spotty at best. Alternatively, supporters of Mr. Sonko claim that the entire trial was politically motivated. Much like many of you, Swag didn't even know that the country of Senegal existed prior to working on this story. And to say there isn't much information online about this case would be putting it lightly. This once again might be a case where we encourage viewers to come to their own conclusions, because we sure as shit don't have the answers this time. With this in mind, supporters of Usman Sonko, who as previously mentioned, tend to be quite young, took to the streets in protest after he was sentenced believing that his arrest was simply a political maneuver to sabotage him. What resulted was essentially Sonko's political party weaponizing its young supporters against the current government, and the government weaponizing Senegalese law enforcement against these protesters. Amnesty International counted at least 23 deaths in the resulting violence, including two members of the security forces. It's hard to know what's happening on the ground within the country, as the government has ordered a social media blackout shortly after the protests began. But as far as we can tell, protests are still taking place within the nation. As always, if shit spirals into a coup, civil war, or an MMA cage match for the top spot, we'll be sure to follow up on the situation next month. Our next story is about former US President Donald Trump. So for obvious reasons, we're going to be even more careful to remain as unbiased as possible and let you, the audience, make up your own mind on the situation. On the 8th of June, a federal indictment against both Mr. Trump and his personal aide, Waltine Nauta, was announced, charging the pair with a series of crimes stemming from Trump's handling of classified documents after he left office. To simplify the story, we'll be specifically talking about Mr. Trump himself. All totaled, the former US president faces 37 total charges, with 31 counts of willful retention of national defense information making up the majority of the list. The other six include conspiracy to obstruct justice, withholding a document or record, corruptly concealing a document or record, concealing a document in a federal investigation, scheme to conceal, and false statements and representations. The 31 counts of willful retention directly pertain to Mr. Trump keeping the documents, while the other six are related to attempts attempting to prevent law enforcement from finding them. To give a bit more context, when a president leaves office, the Presidential Records Act requires that the president's records from their time in office be transferred to the National Archives and Records Administration, or NARA for short. In March 2021, three months after Trump left office, NARA became aware that there were records from the Trump administration missing. After several demands to return the missing documents, including threats to involve the Justice Department in enforcement, NARA finally received the documents in January of 2022. However, after reviewing the papers, they noticed that there were a number of classified documents among the boxes returned, which caused them to immediately freak the fuck out. NARA officials would immediately refer to the Justice Department 
to investigate if Trump illegally retained classified information. After an investigation, the FBI conducted a raid on Trump's Florida residence, Mar-a-Lago, on the 8th of August last year. There, investigators seized over 11,000 documents across 33 boxes, of which 103 were classified to some degree, meaning keeping them there was potentially a violation of the Espionage Act. Following the search, the FBI handed over authority to a special counsel, who took control over the investigation in November. And after reviewing evidence, they announced their indictment on the 8th of June. Trump is specifically charged under Section E of the Espionage Act of 1917, which basically says if a person holds classified information and fails to hand it back, they could get in very big trouble. As you may have guessed, none of us on the news team have a legal background. Prosecutors have asked for a speedy trial, hoping to potentially finish before the 2024 election. Pre-trial motions are due by the 24th of July, and the trial itself is currently scheduled to begin August 11th. With this in mind, some experts believe that the start date is unlikely to be kept, as Trump's team will most likely file a number of motions challenging everything they can about the case. The prosecution, however, states that they have completed the investigation and evidence gathering to the highest ethical standard, and asked for an early start to attempt to blunt how long Trump's team could delay the trial in the first place. Either way, these are the most serious charges Trump has faced to date, though it remains to be seen if the prosecution can make these charges stick to the former president. It should be noted that although the indictment has hurt Trump's popularity among Democratic voters and independents, the former president has enjoyed a higher approval rating among Republican voters, who largely see the trial as a politically motivated witch hunt. Regardless of the results of the trial, even if Trump is found guilty, and even if the judge hands him a prison sentence, nothing would actually stop him from running for president next year. With Trump facing more than 350 years in prison if convicted, viewers should probably expect some crazy shit to happen, regardless of the results. The social media app Twitter has come under fire this month, as the platform continues to struggle with moderation teething problems since Elon Musk bought the company in October last year. Musk himself has long described himself as a free speech absolutist, and touted his vision of Twitter as, quote, the de facto public town square. But in the roughly nine months since taking over the app, detractors have criticized his management as being inconsistent to this original philosophy. According to an analysis of the data by the technology information portal, Rest of World, Twitter has approved 83% of all censorship requests from authoritarian governments, up from 50% before the acquisition. Perhaps most significantly was in Turkey, when only a day before the Turkish election in May, the platform would ban hundreds of tweets and several accounts from the platform. This notably included investigative journalist Sevri Guven, who also happened to be investigating allegations of corruption against President Erdogan. Musk himself would later respond to criticism of this decision, stating that it's far better to have a few accounts limited rather than the entire platform shut off in the country entirely. However, critics have argued that the entire platform forcefully shutting down before an election would be a far stronger statement for the principles of free speech. To them, targeted bans a day before an election is exponentially more damaging than putting everyone on an even playing field. Government censorship aside, Twitter has also come under fire for its current content moderation. Perhaps not so surprising, considering the platform has cut its workforce as much as 80% since coming under new management. In the early days of the Twitter purchase, Elon Musk made a concerted effort to uphold his promise of being a free speech absolutist, and would promptly reinstate as many as 60,000 accounts that had previously been banned for terms of service violations. Unfortunately, this would also come with some unintended consequences for the platform. The BBC would conduct an investigation on 1,100 of the biggest accounts which had been restored, and found that over the next three months, 190 were found to have promoted hate and violence in some form or another, and an additional 270 were found to have spread verifiable misinformation. Furthermore, the use of the N-word would also increase 500%, while tweets with the word Jew were five times more common. <laughs> Although this initial spike in dodgy content has dropped, governing bodies around the world are less than convinced that the platform has done enough to curtail hateful content. Australia's eSafety Commissioner has stated that Twitter accounts for a third of all complaints within her department, more than any other platform. Meanwhile, the newly published EU Digital Services Act will require social media companies like Twitter to crack down on hate speech, disinformation, and other harmful materials on their sites, violations of which can be as much as 6% of annual global revenue. Despite Mr. Musk's claims that such speech has declined under his leadership, it was difficult to find a single third-party analysis that didn't come to the opposite conclusion. Likely as most reports were published near the end of last year, 
Part of what makes this situation so difficult is because there is no blanket definition of hate speech under American law. Depending on how it's measured by each party, you could theoretically shift the needle any way you wanted, and this, just as a reminder, is just within American law. Another aspect of the Twitter acquisition which was less harmful, but often criticized as working against Musk's original vision, is the reworking of the site's verification system. As many are likely aware, Twitter users who were at risk of being impersonated were historically given a blue tick next to their name, which would verify their identity on the platform. Post-acquisition, this would instead be rolled into a subscription system, where anyone could get hold of such verification for as little as $8 a month. This system would promptly be reworked again as users quickly figured out that they could essentially pose as billion dollar companies. This would quite famously lead to incidents where users would pose as a particular company and wipe hundreds of millions from their valuation by simply announcing that the organization strived to become more ethical. Since then, Twitter has actually prioritized accounts who pay for the subscription when replying to tweets, essentially making the platform pay to win. If a person is paying $8 a month, their replies will always be put above those who do not. Although there's nothing inherently wrong with giving paying customers priority over free users, critics have argued that this decision runs contrary to Mr. Musk's promise of making Twitter the de facto public town square. They argue that as soon as a person is able to pay to have their ideas above others, the platform stops being a free marketplace of ideas and is instead a place where people can pay to have their thoughts louder than those who don't open their wallets. In terms of new features, Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter has been received quite well. However, with dramatic staff cutbacks and long-running problems with moderation, experts have raised serious calls for concern that the platform is not only amplifying the sources of harmful content, but undermining the principles of democracy that the site was built upon. Twitter still holds a very competitive market share in the social media space. However, these challenges in the realm of moderation and user protections will need to be addressed quickly, before the regulatory bodies start getting serious. However, if on the off chance Twitter is banned in your country, you might be interested in today's sponsor. If you're sick of media not being available in your country, or you just want an extra layer of privacy, then you'll probably want a VPN. And luckily for you, Surfshark is here to help. It used to be that only Santa Claus and the CIA could be everywhere at once. But with Surfshark VPN, you'll be able to appear anywhere in the world in the push of a button. Gone are the days of having a collection of 50 scuffed up movies that your cousin Vinny conveniently told you fell off the back of a truck. Simply set your location to anywhere in the world and enjoy roughly 6 billion new shows of movies right at your fingertips. Signing up with the code on screen will give viewers 3 whole months for free, and users who aren't 100% satisfied can back out within the first 30 days and get a full refund. Surfshark VPN. It's cheaper than the other ones. Meanwhile, a shop owner in San Francisco says that living in the city is worse than his home country of Afghanistan. The CDC reports that nearly one in five Americans is depressed and a surgeon in Germany is fired after getting a cleaner to assist in an amputation. Towards the end of May and the start of June, Finland observed unexpected changes to the price of electricity that would scare the shit out of oil barons the world over. On May 24th, the average price of energy dropped slightly below zero, making electricity almost completely emission-free in its extreme abundance. While no Finnish citizen was reported to have been getting paid to use their electricity, this extraordinary result has many in the country excited for the future of energy. Countries within the European Union have struggled with energy costs ever since Russia invaded Ukraine, with many being heavily reliant on oil and gas exports from President Putin's stockpile. With sanctions in effect, Europe has largely been cut off from this once abundant source of energy, and has since scrambled at great cost to develop alternatives. The source of Finland's energy abundance can largely be attributed to the Oculoto 3, a nuclear plant that was officially brought online in April 2023. Oculoto 3 is the first nuclear plant to open in Europe within the last 15 years, and currently stands as the third most powerful in the world. While most countries across Europe have seen the cost of energy rise significantly, prices in Finland have decreased a whopping 75% between December last year and May this year dropping to as low as 60.55 euro per megawatt hour. In addition to the efficiencies of nuclear power, floodings resulting from excessive meltwater during the spring and summer season have made hydropower overproduce beyond the normal values. Finland now faces the unique problem of being too energy efficient to the point of needing to handicap their own nuclear production just to remain profitable, a problem that most governments around the world could only dream of having. Nuclear energy, quite unfortunately, tends to get a bad reputation for being dangerous and unpredictable. 
which is likely why Europe has all but stopped developing them since the turn of the century. In reality, however, nuclear power has historically caused 800 times less deaths than coal and is even statistically safer than wind power. The main drawback of nuclear energy is that it's really fucking expensive to build a nuclear plant, and it takes a long fucking time. Oculoto 3 first began construction in 2005 and would end up costing 11 billion euros to build. So countries looking to use nuclear to meet their 2050 carbon neutral deadlines are going to have to start soon. Finland is aiming to be carbon free by the year 2035, while predominantly using wind power for its main energy source by the year 2027. It's not often that we actually get to share a positive news story on this series, so we'd like to thank the nation of Finland for doing us all a solid. Summer in Ukraine is finally here, making it an excellent time to get a nice tan, set up a picnic, and continue to embarrass what was once thought to be one of the mightiest armies in the world. The beginning of June would spell great news for Ukraine, as Secretary General of NATO, Jen Stoltenberg, would announce that the nation would eventually be allowed to join, once the war with Russia had concluded. We should probably point out that a big part of Russia invading in the first place is that they really didn't want Ukraine to join NATO, and they certainly didn't want NATO to expand their influence in Eastern Europe. In one of the most galaxy brain plays of all time, not only did Vladimir Putin fast-track Ukraine's application, but it unintentionally strengthened the NATO alliance and boosted military spending across Europe. The reason Ukraine will have to wait to join NATO is because member countries all agree to come to each other's aid should any of them come under attack. As you might imagine, the alliance is understandably cautious about dragging in as many as 8 million military personnel into the conflict pretty much overnight. While this announcement does not present an immediate solution to stop the fighting, NATO intends to continue its support in Ukraine in the months of the war to come, stating that they will need to prepare for what happens after the war to ensure that history doesn't repeat itself. The most notable event of this month came on June 6th, when the Nova Kokova Dam in the Russian-occupied area of southern Kherson collapsed, causing major flooding to the region and all locations west of the dam. The dam's destruction is being considered by the United Nations as, quote, the most significant damage to civilian infrastructure since the start of the war. Reports indicate that over 3,500 people have been evacuated from the flooded areas, with at least 46 people confirmed dead and well over 100 injured. The rising water has caused the destruction of residential areas and farmlands within the affected regions, while also severing electrical power and tainting water supplies. At time of writing, the facts of the dam's destruction are still being evaluated by experts in the field. Russia claims that Ukraine intentionally sabotaged the dam to deprive the Crimean Peninsula of water, while Ukraine claims that the dam was deliberately blown up from the inside by Russian soldiers. At 2.35 a.m. and 2.54 a.m. on June 6, seismic detectors in Ukraine and Romania detected the telltale signs of large explosions, leading many to believe that this is the main cause for the collapse. Experts also say that the dam is non-recoverable, meaning that it's been damaged to a point where it cannot be fixed. Although we're not yet able to determine who blew up the dam, the act was clearly intentional, and the end result was more than catastrophic. Evacuating citizens in the affected regions are still being bombarded with constant shelling, with at least nine people wounded in Kherson City while attempting to escape the flooding. While the United Nations and other volunteer organizations aid Ukraine-controlled regions experiencing flooding, Russia has denied the United Nations from operating in its controlled regions, citing, quote, security, and a lot of issues and many other nuances, for why they cannot help people in the area. Russia claims that they will be administering aid within their controlled regions to those who are affected. Russia is probably lying. This month also saw government authorities from both Russia and Ukraine state that Ukraine's long-anticipated counteroffensive has begun. Ukrainian officials claim that within the area of Bakhmut, 20 square kilometers have been regained from Russia, while within the western Donetsk region, some smaller villages have been reclaimed. While heavy fighting still rages on in areas west of the Donetsk itself, Ukrainian officials also state that they have made significant headway in the Zaporizhia region, but are being halted by Russian defensive forces. At time of writing, fighting is still ongoing, and information surrounding territorial gains and losses are subject to change. Commenting on the counteroffensive, the Institute for the Study of War stated, quote, Ukraine has not yet committed the vast majority of its counteroffensive forces, and Russian defenses are not uniformly strong along all sectors of the front line. Even though information is constantly changing as the fighting rages on, it is safe to say that all regions of Ukraine are experiencing an uptick in combat this month. 
It is also difficult to report the situation accurately as we would have liked, as the Ukrainian military have called for strategic silence during the counteroffensive. We're also unable to rely on Russian reports, as they've tended to be as dependable as that one kid on Xbox Live, who claimed, without citing credible sources, they had sexual relations with your mother the night before. This month's best clip of the war is easily this footage of what appears to be a Ukrainian vehicle disguised as a house. The vehicle itself was first featured on a Ukrainian news channel in September 2020 and was later used as a prop in the music video of the Ukrainian rap group Kalush. Some observers have pointed out that the use of such a vehicle may constitute a war crime, as nations are required to distinguish between military objects and things of a civilian nature. The whole point is to not give justifiable cause for one side to attack civilian targets. However, as we keep pointing out, Russia tends to do this a lot anyway. Ultimately, no source we could find could verify whether the house car was carrying weapons, troops, or had any kind of internal fortifications. But even the prospect makes the conflict even more complicated. As always, we intend to continue our coverage of the war, as the counteroffensive ramps up over the coming months. Perhaps a factor often overlooked when looking at the Russian invasion of Ukraine is its impact on the economies of the nations involved. And as you might expect, economists from both sides are drinking a little more vodka to cope. Within Russia, 300 billion euro in assets have been frozen by sanctions. The country has officially entered a recession, and the war itself is reportedly costing a staggering 500 million to 1 billion dollars a day. Despite harsh sanctions from the EU and other allied countries, Russian oil exports managed to generate more money in 2022 than from the previous year. However, this was partly due to the nation riding high oil prices that have since decreased. Russian oil revenue has fell nearly 6% in March from the previous year, and as much as 64% in April, quite significant for a product widely considered the lifeblood of Russia's economy. With this in mind, sanctions against Russia have not been as effective as some may have hoped, along with non-NATO nations who are happily picking up the economic slack left in the wake of these sanctions. It also appears as if workarounds have been developed for importing goods into Russia. According to a Norwegian-based risk consultancy firm, 8.5 billion euro worth of goods have circumvented sanctions, which might explain why Russia's economy supposedly only shrank 2.1% last year, much less than expected. The way this was figured out didn't exactly take a genius, as although EU firms would see a dramatic drop in exports to Russia, neighboring countries like Kazakhstan, Belarus and Armenia would see an unusual spike in the demand of these same items. Countries who had previously imported virtually no chemicals used to produce body armor were suddenly buying 200 tons per month. And this is when the Sherlocks of the world started to get suspicious. While the EU looks to patch these unintended exploits, Russia itself has struggled with its own unique economic challenge. The biggest of which is that people who become too educated don't want to live in Russia. The nation is currently experiencing a serious brain drain among its population, with a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences stating that no other country has lost so many workers in the scientific field over the past five years. 50,000 scientists have left Russia since 2018, and last year alone, the nation is said to have lost a whole 10% of its tech workforce, as much as 100,000 people. Since the start of the invasion, as many as a million Russian citizens have fled the country. And these have tended to be the types of people the nation really doesn't want to lose. According to a survey taken in March and April, 81% of migrants from Russia had a university degree, a staggering figure considering just 27% of the Russian population at large has such qualifications. Younger people within Russia tend to be much more likely to be conscripted into the war effort, less likely to show approval of the Russian government and tend to be more educated than the older members of society which creates something of a difficult situation domestically. These workers can either stay within Russia, facing the threat of being drafted into a deadly war they probably don't support, or attempt to immigrate to another country, where they'll more than likely be earning significantly more than should they remain home. Many Western nations see this as an absolute win from their perspective, as not only is immigration needed to compensate for declining birth rates, but having a steady supply of young professionals who come educated out of the box does absolute wonders for the overall economy. Although the base cost of war and a bombard of economic sanctions are likely going to make it much harder for Russia to sustain itself in the short term, the exodus of the educated workers and the war now claiming the lives of as many as 200,000 Russians is going to be far more damaging in the long term. 
The economies of both Russia and Ukraine have suffered untold damage from this war, and its citizens will likely be feeling its effects for decades to come. Only hours after finishing our script for Ukraine this month, the world witnessed what appeared to be a fucking coup attempt. So the following is what we managed to speedrun in the final few days of the month. It's a poorly kept secret that Wagner Group, Russia's infamous mercenary organization, has long been at odds with the traditional Russian army, with occasional friendly fire incidents being reported between the two sides. This month, however, Wagner's leader, Vivgeny Prigozhin, would escalate the rivalry dramatically, stating publicly that the war had nothing to do with the official justification of ridding Ukraine of Nazis, or even to curb the threat of NATO. Instead, Prigozhin stated that the entire operation was about the Russian Minister of Defense, Sergei Shoigu, and his desire to earn himself another medal. The feud would continue on the 10th of June, when Shoigu would announce that the Wagner soldiers would now be required to sign contracts with his ministry, effectively spelling an end to the mercenary organization. Just over two weeks later, Prigozhin would claim that Russia's defense ministry had carried out an attack on a Wagner camp, showing footage of a burning campsite somewhere in the occupied Donbass. Experts could not verify the validity of the footage, with many speculating that it could have been staged. According to the New York Times, US intelligence agencies have observed signs of a serious plot for some time. On the 23rd of June, a column of Wagner soldiers left Ukraine into Russia and would eventually enter the city of Rostov-on-Don, taking control of the military HQ, from which the war was being run. The building was supposedly taken without resistance, and residents appeared unbothered by their presence, with some posing for photos in front of the tanks. On the following day, Putin would make a national address, accusing Wagner of treason, while Moscow itself was fortified, with armored vehicles and barricades. Supposedly, Putin himself fled to his private residence near Lake Valdai, but we couldn't verify this claim. The Wagner convoy would continue its journey north into Voronezh, where they would shoot down both a Ka-52 attack helicopter and an IL-18 aircraft. At least 18 Russian servicemen died in the aftermath. At around 8 p.m. that night, President of Belarus and Harry Potter's uncle, Alexander Lukashenko, would announce that the rebellion had been called off, as an agreement had been struck. The deal didn't come a moment too soon, as the convoy was a mere two hours from entering Moscow. According to a Kremlin spokesperson, Wagner personnel involved in the incident would be granted amnesty and be given the choice to join the regular Russian army. Prigozhin himself would go into exile in Belarus, a fate that seemed astoundingly lenient from Putin, who has become infamous for making his enemies fall out of windows. Prigozhin, a former hot dog seller, has been affiliated with Vladimir Putin for the last two decades and reaffirms his intention was never to overthrow the government of Russia. The leader of Wagner did not, however, miss an opportunity to shit-talk the Russian army stating that his push into Moscow was a masterclass in how the country should have started its initial invasion into Ukraine. He would go on to say, quote, If mercenaries from Wagner had been carrying out the tasks, perhaps this special operation would have lasted a day. As far as we can tell, this bizarre situation wasn't a foreign-backed plot to aid Wagner, or even a coup to overthrow Putin. In a situation where Russia's best soldiers tend to join its state-aligned mercenary organization, this appears to be closer to the group going on strike, as opposed to attempting to install a new government. Wagner have consistently been at odds with the traditional Russian military, criticizing it for being corrupt, incompetent, and sabotaging their ability to fight. With this in mind, it's likely that Wagner forces are far too valuable to be punished for this short-lived rebellion, which is why they were so quickly pardoned. Although the capabilities of the Russian military do not seem to be substantially impacted by Vigeny Prigozhin's exciting road trip towards Moscow, it does seem to have struck a significant blow at Vladimir Putin's reputation. Within Russia, there is an understanding that under Putin's rule, citizens are expected to trade personal rights for the stability that Putin provides. However, when a former hot dog salesman can seemingly drive up to the gates of Moscow with a private army without so much as being slowed down, it could be seen as Putin struggling to keep his grip on power. Viewers should be aware that this is still a developing situation, and that new or conflicting details may have surfaced from the time of writing. As always, we'll continue to monitor the war in Ukraine until it finally reaches its conclusion. The news might be over, but the Swag News team never stops. To take a quick peek behind the scenes, the way we work on videos isn't necessarily a straight line from A to B. Sometimes writers might be doing the groundwork for a video we release several months from now, and other times we're lucky enough to start a video and finish it within a week. Our goal is to have enough of these projects going at once so that even if they take several months from start to finish, it will look like we're able to make them a lot faster than we can. The news itself takes up a lot of this bandwidth, as having to pull 
enable 10 plus people for a single video can slow down the progress of everything else. But as long as you're willing to watch, we'll be willing to keep making them. With this in mind, if our rate of releases is too slow, our second channel, the Sir Swag Academy, might be able to help in the meantime. As of this month, the channel has blazed past 15,000 subscribers, and it focuses on summarizing larger topics we might cover, as well as what might be best described as five adults doing show and tell. Two pounds of boneless chicken thighs for $4.33. F excuse you, all right? In what world do you pay four dollars for two pounds of chicken? Are you crazy? We should also take the time to thank our wonderful Patreon supporters who make the series possible. Not only does your support keep monthly news going, but it also subsidizes other videos that YouTube doesn't see fit to monetize. And in a particular video we have planned, you'll be glad we have that luxury. On behalf of the Swag News team, we'd like to thank every single one of you for watching, and we'd like to wish everyone a very happy July. Oh, I like paint pots and I cannot lie You are the brothers, I can't deny That when a girl walks in with an itty bitty weight Stand around teeny in your face You get sprung, you get sprung Oh, you get sprung The deep in the jeans she's wearing I looked and I can't stop staring Baby got back Ooh. My anaconda don't want none Unless you got the buzz high I'm begging for a piece of that bubble So go and find that juicy double And you get sprung Oh, and you get sprung I don't know one, no other but Now baby, it's just years out I'm thinking of